Good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to the American Enterprise Institute. I know you were waiting for the McKenzie brothers on this cold day. Those of you who used to be SCTV fans, uh, Bob and Doug, uh, take off, eh? Uh, but uh, due to the, uh, the, the weather, we're uh, at a little bit more of an intimate gathering uh, this morning. We appreciate you uh, turning out, for those of you who turned out here live. Uh, it's uh, liberal leave policy, actually, as our, our approach at AEI today, so I guess Norm Ormstein won't be coming in. Uh, but in any case, um, we are uh, down one uh, on the ice uh, today. Uh, one of our discussants, Mark Pauley, has been uh, snowed in uh, in Philadelphia, proving once again that it's not always sunny in Philadelphia, uh, at <laughs> least in uh, January. Uh, but there are plenty of seats still available uh, for today's game, uh, if uh, those of you who want to uh, turn up uh, a little bit late. Uh, what we're talking about today is uh, reconnecting uh, health care policy with economics and uh, finding and fixing distortive incentives. We have uh, a co-author uh, of, of a new book uh, from uh, actually late uh, November, uh, Charles Phelps, most commonly known as uh, Chuck Phelps. Those of you who haven't already uh, studied his uh, multiple editions of uh, perhaps the foremost uh, health economics uh, textbook uh, in, in, in college, uh, sometimes called the uh, gold standard. Uh, but we went off the gold standard uh, some time ago, so we'll see how the floating currencies go on that front. It's during competition. He, he, has, he has a new book called uh, The Economics of U.S. Healthcare Policy. Um, now, Chuck does have a uh, co-author, but uh, pending Senate confirmation, he shall have to, uh, there's Chuck, and he shall have to be uh, simply, uh, he must not be named. Uh, <laughs> there is a, some, some issue of perhaps there was some uh, separated at birth issues here. Uh, you see kind of he who must not be named Lord Voldemort. And then uh, a remarkable uh, you know, overlap there of a less evil twin. You can pick up the resemblance. His middle name is Tom, uh, but it still remains pretty much a riddle to me. All right. Uh, a brief overview as to where we're likely to be heading today. Uh, the focus is, uh, to some extent, the intersection, uh, the, the usual diagrams of health policy, economics, and politics. Now, if this was drawn to scale, uh, there'd be less of an overlap between the economics and health policy part, perhaps a, a wider overlap between uh, politics and health policy, and thus we have what's been produced. Uh, a different uh, view might depend upon uh, which end of the policy telescope uh, you uh, look at the landscape uh, from uh, in terms of the impact of, uh, well, from the perspective of the health policy sector, uh, the rest of the economy uh, tends to be seen as revolving around health care's wants and needs rather than the opposite, uh, somewhat uh, like the difference in views between Ptolemy and Copernicus as to what is exactly the center of the universe. Uh, but the short version of uh, health policy and practice as opposed to the theories we may be spinning today uh, suggests uh, the usual sequence of uh, some standard imperatives, uh, secure more predictable streams of payment, uh, capture a growing share of the economy, expand third party payment, in other words, other people's money, uh, and most of all, hide, distort, and suppress real prices. Uh, blame everybody else sequentially when it doesn't work out. Uh, take and threaten hostages as needed. Uh, add, don't subtract layers of intervention. Uh, and of course, the hybrid of uh, health care and much of our national policy, profit side capitalism and loss side socialism. Now that's on a good day in Washington. Of course, we're all telecommuting today, those of us who are not here uh, live and in person. Uh, but uh, the net effect of uh, all this uh, history of health policy is what's often used to uh, justify a string of policy changes, each one sort of correcting or overcoming the weaknesses of the previous one, and then you can't weaken one without unraveling the dependent links in the chain. Before you know it, you're behind a chain link fence and not having much room to maneuver. So that's the preliminary to uh, what we're going to talk about today. Uh, Charles Phelps, or Chuck Phelps, uh, has a long history at the University of Rochester, uh, going back about three decades ago as a professor and director of policy and public policy analysis program. Uh, he subsequently became uh, provost in uh, 1994, served there for 13 years, responsible for overseeing uh, a good bit of everything in the uh, academic world. Once again, the administrative bloat in the healthcare policy, you know, rings true. Uh, but uh, 
He uh, currently holds the titles of uh, university professor and provost emeritus, also had a long career at the uh, RAND Corporation. And if you want to know what was behind the RAND health insurance experiment, uh, you've got a person who uh, was right there and knows uh, just about a chapter and verse on that one. Now, Chuck is uh, retired, uh, although he's very active for someone who's retired to Mendocino uh, County in Northern California. He writes and consults regularly and waits for the latest, latest the natural disaster to occur in California. Uh, we haven't had the locusts arrive, but just about everything else seems to uh, come through at various times. Uh, we'll also have Mark Hall uh, discussing this. And as I mentioned before, uh, Mark Foley is unable to join us today, which we regret. Uh, I'll introduce Mark separately, but let's uh, get started with uh, Chuck Phelps. Go right ahead. Just click on the Thank you and good morning. Um, Mentioned that I'm affiliated with the University of Rochester, but uh, not there anymore. In fact, uh, where I left uh, yesterday to come here, uh, this is the view from my home on the Pacific Ocean in Northern California. There are 15 pelicans in that picture, if you'll stop to count them. Um, shameless promotion to start off. Uh, uh, first book I wrote in this uh, area several years ago, published from Hoover Press, Eight Questions You Should Ask About Our Healthcare System. Uh, I think of this as the diagnosis. Um, then if you want the tools to help understanding it, uh, uh, my textbook, Health Economics, just hit its sixth edition. And finally, the subject of today's talk, and oops, there's the name that shall, shall not be named, uh, the Economics of U.S. Uh, healthcare Policy, and that's going to be the subject of today's talk. Uh, you can, of course, buy the book online at Amazon.com, and I urge you to do so. <laughs> Our primary goals in uh, writing this, it was not about just trying to dissect any individual piece of legislation like the Affordable Care Act or predecessors has been proposed, but rather to look across the entire landscape and find incentives that ad adversely distort people's behavior and get rid of them. It's a very simple task. Um, there's a lot of those to work on. So from 30,000 foot view, we divide the book into three parts, the under 65 market, which I'm gonna spend a good chunk of my time on momentarily. Uh, particularly the uh, tax subsidy to, um, and employer paid health insurance. And, and within the Affordable Care Act, one of the few things that we talk about specific legislation, uh, the mandates and the pre precious metals and health insurance exchanges. Uh, there's a series of uh, suggestions we have about Medicare and Medicaid. Uh, again, distortions that we think need to be removed and repaired. Uh, and then a bunch of things that affect everybody. And I'm going to spend a little more time on those at the end. Uh, chronic conditions, fraud and abuse, electronic health records, and finally it was something that's been bothering me for much of my life. Why do you get these health bills for outrageous numbers that don't have any meaning to anybody? So the under 65 market, uh, some history of how we got there in a parallel universe that will discuss our proposal to remove the tax subsidy and how to do it, uh, the employer mandate, the precious metals and the individual mandate. So those are the topics I'm gonna to touch on momentarily. Proposition and resolution, I'll say the most important healthcare law ever passed in the United States is not Medicare or, or the Affordable Care Act, but this little provision, the 1954 tax code says that there's no income tax paid on employer paid health insurance and a big tip of the hat to Bob Helms for laying out the history of this. Mm -hmm. Our fix is to remove this uh, favorable tax treatment immediately and totally, and at the same time, proportionally reduce all marginal tax rates on income and payroll taxes, so that if nothing else changes across the board, net tax revenue is unchanged. But of course, with the lower marginal tax rates on labor, uh, there will be an expansion in the economy. I'll talk about estimates of how large that would be, uh, so that on net you have a guaranteed increase in the economic, uh, a permanent increase in the size of the economy and associated tax revenues. It's not all that large. It's not going to solve the budget deficit, but basically, where this is a uh, remove the tax subsidy and reduce marginal tax rates, so you expand the tax base and then give it back to everybody uh, through the tax system. Uh, what do we have now with this tax subsidy in place? This is uh, very important. We have too much insurance for those with employer-sponsored plans because of the tax subsidy. I think every health economist in the world would agree with that statement. Other markets, the non, uh, and I'm sorry Mark Pauly is not here since he's focused on these a lot, uh, the, the non-group markets have been squeezed out because of the tax subsidy and squeezed out from below with federal programs like Medicaid and, and CHIP. Uh, we have a major wealth transfer in this system from the poor to the rich. 
Uh, we have insufficient attention on people buying health insurance to cost controlling plans. Because of the uh, too much health care, health insurance, we have, I would argue, too many new technologies entering the healthcare system. Uh, we have impaired job mobility. That's gotten better with various fixes, but it still persists in some extent as people are afraid to move jobs because of health insurance coverage for special conditions. We have permanent job loss when you intersect the employer mandate with minimum uh, wage rules. We have unnecessary work stoppages, uh, uh, unions and management combating over uh, health insurance coverage. And we have a Medicare program that's probably overly generous because when it came into being, it mimicked the health insurance that was in place at that time, which was based in part on the subsidized insurance plans. How do we get into this mess? Again, thanks to Bob Helm's history on this. It goes back to the wage and price controls of World War II. It, there was it, wage controls in order to attract high quality workers, uh, employers noticed that they could give up to 5% fringe benefits that were not considered violation of the wage controls in, in health insurance and life insurance. And those were not only bypassed the wage control structure, but they also were excluded from the tax base. In 1954, this was codified in a, actually a wonderful natural experiment for us. The health insurance uh, bypass was codified with no cap, have unending uh, tax exempt employer paid health insurance. Life insurance was capped at the value of a $50,000 term life policy, and that still persists today. How many in this room have uh, an employer that gives you $50,000 worth of term life insurance for free? I suspect many of you do. The reason for that is because of that tax law. Okay? We'll see how that tells us what's going on in this world. This provides a natural experiment for us to understand what would happen once the, our proposal is uh, uh, put in place to eliminate the tax subsidy. The life insurance market is a perfect template. Uh, almost every employer offers this, 95% or so, and there's a huge uptake rate in, among workers when they have it. It's not just 50,000 in life insurance, but most employers offer supplemental insurance that's not tax subsidized. There's a huge economy of scale in providing this insurance through the group structure. So it's one to three times salary or some fixed dollar amount you can buy, and very, very large uptake of this among workers when it's offered and widespread offering. So this large market exists outside of the employer-based market. The current face value of life insurance in force in the United States today is about $21 trillion. About three-eighths of that, $8 trillion, is through employer plans, most of which is not tax subsidized. It's that little $50,000 nibble that's tax subsidized. And so there you have this extraordinarily rich, varied market with this huge variety of offerings in the life insurance market. That's what the health insurance market would look like, I argue, if we didn't have the tax subsidy that forces this through employer plans. Here's a graph from the uh, St. Louis Fed that shows the growth of employer paid premiums through time. You can see it's accelerating, uh, uh, little kinks here and there, but now exceeds $600 trillion in premiums that, it, uh, just, uh, that evade the tax base. $600 billion, I'm sorry. Uh, per year that evade the tax base. That's the money we have to play with when we make that taxable income. So this employer-sponsored insurance that snuck in the door through World War II uh, turns out to have major impact on the way people think about public policy. And as you go back and look at this, I would say that every major national health insurance plan that's been proposed, going back to the I uh, pro uh, probably have to exclude things that Truman proposed, which was basically uh, Medicare for all. Kennedy, uh, Richard Nixon, Teddy Kennedy, Jimmy Carter, the Clinton plan in 92, and obviously the Affordable Care Act, all had this sort of three-legged structure. Keep employer-paid health insurance plans in place for those uh, people. Keep Medicare in place, and then expand Medicaid in some way and federalize it in some circumstances to cover everybody else. That has been the basic plan. Everybody is relying on this employer-sponsored health insurance market, and hence nobody is really thinking about how to get rid of that tax subsidy and take that away from the system. But this tax subsidy is unique throughout the world, and I think in reasonable uh, to say that it's significantly responsible for the fact that we're by far the largest spending country in the world on dollars or on a per capita uh, basis, even adjusting for income effects. It's because of this tax subsidy. And the proposals to fix this have been capped uh, 
Uh, cap the amount that could be subsidized and then tax excesses, that's kind of the Cadillac tax, or a cap and replace with a tax credit, a proposal from Ellen Enthoven. But these proposals have all left, all these previous proposals to deal with this uh, employer paid tax subsidy have left a large chunk of the stuff still subsidized. So many, many, in large cases, most of the people involved in these markets have been uh, unaffected by these changes in terms of the tax structure. So uh, our proposal differs from this importantly because every single person's tax uh, uh, employer paid subsidy is removed. So what would insurance uh, suppliers do if our policy was put in place? Employers, I would say, will continue to offer health insurance coverage to their employees, just as they do life insurance now. Uh, they would convert the insurance premiums they've been paying into taxable income, uh, and the IRS would need to provide a table to do that so that they'd have a basis for doing that. Here's what the table looks like on the life insurance policy for premiums above $50,000. So this is a, the actual table from the IRS. You can see there is a very steep age gradient on this table. Five cents per thousand dollars for the under 25 and running up to over two dollars uh, for people who uh, age 70 and up. There would be a similar table produced for health insurance premiums that would have a similar age gradient under our proposal. The IRS would have to do that, and then companies would use that as a template for deciding how much money to hand back to their employees and wages. And very rapidly, you'd see a conversion of the employer paid uh, subsidies to wages, and then people would go out and buy health insurance from wherever they wanted. Uh, insurance companies would expand into individual markets much more extensively than they do now. You'd have unions, fraternal groups, perhaps even municipalities getting into the business of health insurance, teaming perhaps with United or uh, Aetna or somebody like that, uh, much like AARP does with United Healthcare now. And the non-group market would be vastly richer than it is now. Uh, see the life insurance market as a preview. What would buyers do? Employees and others, those who have not had the benefit of the health insurance, they'd shop around more. I mean, employees uh, would shop around for sure. There'd be more attention to cost controlling plans, higher deductibles, um, more HMO panels, uh, uh, those sorts of things that would control costs because the subsidies elimination would force them to think about those things in a different way. Some employees perhaps might drop coverage. That would be the first iron law of economics. It says when the price of something goes up, people will buy less of it. But perhaps not, because although they might drop their employer coverage, it's still going to be much cheaper to come through the employer market because of the natural economies of scale of uh, providing insurance through large groups. And that economy of scale will persist, and employers will continue to offer it. Um, and they'll have a much richer uh, variety of, <clears throat> of options available in the non-group market uh, because of the expansion that they would be naturally following this. We would also get rid of what I would call a shameful redistribution of income that takes place under the current subsidy. Uh, this is a table from the CBO, the $260 billion worth of tax expenditure. Um, you can see it goes from 8% in the lowest quintile to 34% in the highest quintile. Just adding those up, uh, the, the bottom two quartiles get 22%, the top two quartiles get uh, 60%, and the middle, quintile, I said, uh, the middle quintile gets just about an even share of that. Um, you can see that three to one ratio, it's a money pump that puts about $50 billion a year running from the lowest to the highest income brackets in our country, and I think that's just absolutely shameful to be honest. That would go away with our proposal. What will change? There's about 650, uh, that says trillion, I'm sorry, that should be billion uh, taxable income. It's 5.7% of personal income, 8.5% of Social Security payroll, and 8.04% of the Medicare base. Slight differences there because of the uh, uncapped uh, Medicare base. Tax brackets will, would widen accordingly, just like tax brackets change every year with inflation. So we have a little spreading out of the tax bracket so people are not forced into larger marginal tax brackets. And then marginal tax brackets would fall essentially by the marginal tax rates would fall essentially proportional inversely to the pr proportion of the income base that's associated with it. So marginal income tax rates would each drop by a little under 6%, uh, not percentage points, 6% of their current levels. Uh, FICA would drop by 8.5% and Medicare by 8%. 
that then gives you on net zero change in total tax revenue until you get the change in economic activity associated with the lower marginal tax rates. That's the economic bonus that comes in. Uh, the lower marginal tax rates will unambiguously increase the size of the economy. This is not the Art Laffer curve. The Laffer curve was always an argument about are you going to have enough increase in economic activity to offset the reduction in tax revenue? We've already fixed the tax revenue because we just added $650 billion into the tax base. So we know that the tax revenue is going to increase with any economic activity. Uh, we have three estimates of that in the book. Uh, they average out about 1% uh, increase in economic growth or the size of the economy. It's a permanent increase. It's not a one-time fake stimulus and tax revenues would rise accordingly. Now, 1% is not going to solve the national debt problem, um, but it's at least a small start in going in the right direction, and most importantly, it fixes this distortion in the healthcare markets. So, who would support this change? In my view, uh, it would be people who worry about bending the cost curve in healthcare, uh, people who dislike the income redistribution that I showed you, the money pump from the lower to the higher income uh, segments of the population, uh, people who prefer economic growth should like our proposal. Uh, people who believe in removing distortions and having an un unfettered, untampered market. And people who prefer that individuals have more choice to less. All these are benefits that arise out of our proposal. Who's going to oppose it? Uh, duh, this is pretty simple. <laughs> uh, people that have higher than average proportions of their wages coming through employer paid premiums will oppose it. They will lose out on that. It turns out that's about 7% of your income is the break-even point. So if you have more than 7% uh, as employer paid of your total compensation is, uh, is uh, employer paid in uh, premiums, you're going to come out worse off on this. Typically labor unions, we don't have to guess about this, they vigorously oppose the Cadillac tax. Uh, state and local government workers have a heavy proportion of payment for health insurance premiums and would be a, 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 probably a standing source of opposition to this proposal, although oddly not federal, they're about neutral on that, uh, federal workers. Health insurance companies would lose their preferred tax status. I presume that many of them would squawk about this. Some of them would see the opportunity to be innovative in a different market and perhaps embrace it and perhaps some healthcare providers would worry about it because they realize the trickle down effect as you lower the tax subsidy, people move into more cost conscious health plans and that should eventually dampen demand for healthcare and, and, and dampen demand for new technologies. So some providers of uh, healthcare might uh, oppose this. Cost conscious uh, plans like uh, uh, HMOs, closed panel HMOs, Kaiser and Intermountain and such, I think would probably rejoice in this. It would move the market, their market share up almost certainly. Let's turn, turn now to a couple of specific things about the Affordable Care Act that are important and in, involved in this. Uh, there's two mandates. Uh, we would immediately remove the employer mandate. It is obviously superfluous in this world. Uh, it's, that mandate is particularly damaging to small employers because small employers pay a much higher loading fee on their insurance than large employers do. Uh, the, large employers, it's about four or five percent loading fee. Small employers, it can go up to 35 or 40 percent. So this is a, the, the current mandate is particularly damaging to small employees and the fix built in the Affordable Care Act is in no way near sufficient to deal with that. And there's a possible benefit in international competitiveness in the short run. This depends on your views about what the incidence is of the current uh, premiums. Most economists believe, at least in the long run, that these employer paid premiums will be passed back to workers in terms of lower wages. Uh, certainly, I think that's likely to happen in the long run, but in the short run, removing this uh, employer burden would uh, probably uh, give us a, a, a little upper jolt in international competitiveness, at least in the short run. Uh, the individual mandate, I would reinstate it. Uh, I had, when I wrote the slides up originally, maintain it. That's obviously changed with the current legislation. Uh, I want to discuss the, why I think the individual mandate is important here. Um, it's not about broccoli, it's free riders and a particularly unique form of insurance that I want to talk about. So premise one, is this the genetic time bomb risk? Premise one is that it's a good idea to insure against genetic risks. Those are risks that we can't control. And if they become, once they materialize, they become pre-existing conditions. And if you don't have some way to assure people, people's ability to insure against pre-existing conditions, 
they're in bad trouble when the Gen 8 time bomb goes off. Uh, they are truly out of people's control unless you find a way to choose your parents. Premise two is forbidding use of pre-existing conditions is one way and I think the strongest way to assure that you can provide this insurance. And premise three is if insurers are forbidden to underwrite using pre-existing conditions, which the current law says, and if there's no individual mandate, then we can expect with a reasonable high probability that market failure will occur and the removal of the individual mandate has just provided us at least a weak test of that. Um, there is a separate issue discussed in an appendix in the book that the constitutionality of the individual mandate was decided improperly. I'll not drag you through that argument right now, but there's a much cleaner way to get that constitutionality issue. The mandate requires a standard. That is to say, if you're gonna require people to have insurance, you have to say how much they have to have as a minimum. The current precious metal standard, bronze, silver, gold, platinum, uh, focuses on the wrong thing. It says that more coverage is always better. This is obviously wrong, particularly as you move into the platinum where you have 90% and above coverage because you're introducing uh, increased uh, utilization. Uh, moral hazard is the standard economic term of it. We know that this is a bad idea in the long run economically. 100% coverage at the extreme is a terrible idea and the current precious metal standard implies that 100% coverage would be the best of all. Instead, we would hope to have a plan that scores insurance plans on catastrophic risk protection, access to providers, how it deals with prevention and chronic care, and probably I'd say an income-related high deductible plan would be kind of an ideal standard if you ask me what it should look like. Uh, so now we come to the question with the current legislation, are the current mechanisms in place enough to offset the loss of the individual mandate? Um, the CBO has estimated that uh, 13 million more uninsured people uh, by 2025 is if you remove the mandate, which has been done leg uh, legislatively now. Uh, about a year ago, almost exactly, Steve Parenti estimated a, th a six to eight million loss of coverage in the first year. Um, we won't find out for another year because the mandate's still in place for the, another year, of course. Um, and uh, there's a 10% increase, the CBO has estimated, in premiums in healthcare.gov, which um, may drive uh, some utilization down also. Uh, but the Affordable Care Act market is pretty much insulated from those increases because of income-related subsidies, so it may not matter much. And particularly also, the penalty for not covering yourself under the insurance, uh, the current mandate, has been, in my view, far too small to be meaningful. So in effect, while we have legally a mandate, and while that presumably legal mandate has been removed, the $900 per year tax for not complying, uh, I think is not nearly large enough to actually change people's behavior significantly. So my bottom line conclusion is removal of the mandate may not change things very much. We'll see. I'll find out in a year. I'll come back and we'll find out if that's right. <laughs> Um, and then there's the reinsurance proposals built into the current legislative discussion now, which would uh, cover claims of uh, 50,000 to 500,000, 80% uh, of those. These are all, and then later on 100,000 to 500,000 uh, reinsurance for insurers on individual coverage claims. Uh, these are intended to provide insurers the ri uh, risk guarantees so that they don't leave the market. It's essentially a replacement for the the mandate and the combination of saying uh, you can't use uh, uh, pre-existing conditions in, uh, in uh, underwriting. So that's the tour of the first part of the book. Um, we'll have a chance to come back and have question and answer on this after Mark has given some comments. I'll give you a quick tour through the other parts about it. Uh, part two is Medicare and Medicaid. Um, there's a whole bunch of distortions in these programs that have been built in through the law and they're actually fairly easy to fix legislatively. Um, uh, first is I want to take a look at the premiums for um, Part A and Part B. The left-hand panel here uh, shows the g growth in the premium for Part A hospital care. Uh, the, the top upper line is the actual premium, the diamonds in the bottom line is the circles is what the original uh, deductible would have been had it been adjusted by the CPI. Um, there's this vast difference, it's about a fourfold difference. Uh, the right-hand panel is what's happened in Part B for physician services, and just the opposite has occurred in Part B. This is totally nutty public policy, people. You've got these two uh, deductibles that were set probably reasonably 
uh, correctly originally in the original 65 legislation. And they've changed in completely opposite directions in real terms since then. So uh, you have a Part A deductible that's vastly high and creating large risk for people who are hospitalized. And a Part B premium, which is, in my view, far too small, uh, and these need to be fixed. We would reset the Part A to about half of its current level, about $700 and reset Part B to 375, about twice its current level, and then just adjust both of them together with inflation. Uh, you could uh, argue for different amounts for Part A and the different rules, but effectively what happens that with the choice of $700 is you leave uh, uh, the Medicare system essentially uh, on a neutral financial basis, so you don't have to argue about whether you need a higher payroll taxes or, or, or general income to cover Part A. Um, you could set it so that's 350 and 700 and just say part A is always twice part B and then inflation adjusted. I'd be perfectly happy with that. But what would happen if you do this is that it spread, it, it's essentially neutral on average to Medicare enrollees because those who pay the hospitalization deductible would have a lower, de, a lower payments. Uh, and it's a small fraction of the total, uh, total enrollees. Almost everybody uses Part B and is involved in the deductible, so everybody would get a little bit higher Part B deductible. On average, it would the total premium uh, pay, uh, deductible payments by individuals would level out, but you'd spread it across the entire Medicare population instead of concentrating these payments on the, ho on the most vulnerable of them, those that are hospitalized, and particularly those hospitalized multiple times. So I think this is a win-win. A, a it keeps budget neutral, and it gives more risk protection for people in the, in the Medicare enrollment. Um, the second thing I would do is to uh, change the payment, uh, the, the price for Part B premium so that it reflects regional costs of care. Uh, this is a map from the Dartmouth Atlas. The, the darker colors are higher costs. Uh, the lighter colors are about $7,000 average per person per Medicare enrollee. These are total Medicare billings. Uh, the, the darkest of them are about 12000 almost twice as much. And there's just right now a huge income redistribution going from the frugal communities to the expensive communities. Which one do you live in? Um, I live out there in Northern California where it's very low cost. <laughs> uh, but I used to live in Rochester, New York, which is also in the low cost ah, area. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay. Just uh, if you live in Houston, Texas, uh, or Miami, you're in a very expensive area now. Okay, um, and Los Angeles, and a couple of Reno or Las, uh, Las Vegas, Nevada, and some other oddities. But actually, to be clear, I'm talking. And I would also uh, we would also reprice the uh, um, Part A pay Medicare payments in uh, uh, for employers, employees in the same proportions, uh, in order to involve the employers and everybody into the discussion about. Uh, how to bring costs down in high-cost areas. Um, but to be very clear, Part C and D of Medicare already do this. They're already priced regionally because they're private insurance plans and they begin their pricing structure with regional costs of care. So all this proposal would do would be to bring the payments for Part A and Part B premiums and taxes into line with the more modern parts of Medicare C and D, and that is regionally cost-based. So this is not nearly as radical a proposal as it might sound like. So that's the regionally pricing. Um, I would also, and this is a very important distortion that we need to fix, Medigap plans create a huge fiscal externality. People that buy Medigap plans spend a lot more money than those who do not, and they do not pay for nearly the full cost of their excess consumption. Some of that is selection bias, that is people who think they're going to be sick go out and buy those extra plans, the extra coverage of Medigap, uh, and some of it is not. Uh, we, it's really hard to unravel from existing data how much is selection and how much is, uh, is just the pure price effect of having co-insurance go away and, uh, because of the Medigap plans, which generally remove co-payments almost entirely in the Medicare program. GAO has estimated uh, the numbers you see at the top of the slide, about $8,000 per person for those without Medigap, about 15500 for those who buy Medigap after enrollment, that is on a person-to-person -person basis, those are the most likely to be self-selection. And those who have them as post-retirement benefits, that is they got them through the workplace before, subsidized by the tax system, of course, see, see previous discussion. Um, and they're about 14,000. Um, 
some scholars from Stanford have estimated that the Medigap uh, insurance system adds about 22% to total Medicare expenditures. The, Medig the people paying those premiums do not pay anything nearly that total in their premiums. They just pay for their share of the extra consumption through their copayment structure. Uh, if you take the, Medi the RAND experiment that I was involved in earlier and extrapolate from the non-elderly that that experiment con uh, considered to the elderly, it suggests that the increase in consumption associated with the, uh, full coverage uh, from Medigap is probably a 30 to 50 percent increase in consumption. So some of this is that, let's call it middle ground, 30 percent at least uh, increase in consumption. Some of it is self-selection of sickly people buying the insurance. But I would tax these plans to fully recover those costs. Uh, if they persist in the market, that's fine with me. Uh, if that tax drives them off the market, which uh, Cabral and Mahoney predicted, uh, that is also the proper outcome. Um, there would be uh, a, a natural uh, outcome of this if you did tax these plans. People would shift into other plans currently available that provide them similar risk protection. Uh, there's a, a number of Medicare Advantage plans that provide uh, stop loss uh, coverage. Um, so you would see people moving into these plans right away, and to me that would be the natural evolution. But this is a major distortion in our Medicare system that needs to be fixed. I would also change a bunch of things about Medicare Advantage. Uh, there's a couple of very stupid rules in Medicare Advantage right now that just need to be fixed. Um, one of them is you can't cover prescription drugs in uh, Medicare high deductible plans. Okay. And uh, you can't have yourself or family members putting contributions into an associated HSA plan. So you just get rid of those two restrictions and you'll see people moving into high deductible plans in Medicare. There's almost no HDHP plans in, in uh, Part C now because of those two restrictions. If you want one now, you have to buy the HDHP plan, subject yourself to that out-of-pocket risk of the deductible, and buy a Part D, and buy, uh, 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 well, you can't, buy, you can't buy Medigap plans then, but you gotta go buy a Part D plan. So it's actually much more sane to go out and just, if, you're, if you could buy Part D through these, just go out and, and get one of these plans. Um, and then there's also the restriction that the Part C plans have to cover everything that original Medicare covers. Now this turns out to be a, a simple legal ruling that says you can't have people waive their rights to Part A. <laughs> so if you say you've got to have everything that Part A covers, then the Part C plans have to provide every single service that's covered under Part A. I would like to see competition on the scope of benefits and, Med and Medicare Advantage plans as well. So removing that re restriction would be a good idea. Medicare Part D does allow that. Uh, you have different coverage arrangements in different Part D plans, and I would simply allow something similar to that in Medicare Advantage plans uh, for the scope of benefits entirely. So if Medicare irrationally puts in coverage for some extremely expensive um, um, procedure that costs $2 million per quality adjusted life year, uh, you would not have to have Part C plans following it. Um, the other part about Medicare that needs to be fixed, you go back to the original enabling legislation and it says that Medicare will cover uh, procedures that are reasonable and necessary. There's been no further definition of what those words mean. Uh, the P Affordable Care Act specifically precludes the use of quality adjusted life years in making coverage decisions. Uh, PCORI is prohibited from um, providing uh, uh, any analysis that does this, and the rule, the law also says, uh, bottom line, the secretary, that's the secretary of HHS, shall not utilize an adjusted life year or similar measure as a threshold to determine coverage reimbursement and sending programs under Title 18 mm -hmm. Medicare. So we, we have to fix that so that you can bring cost considerations into Medicare coverage decisions. Um, <coughs> British National Health Service does this most formally through their uh, National Institute for Clinical Effectiveness, NICE. Uh, uh, I would uh, like to see at least consideration of cost, not only allowed but encouraged in our Medicare and Medicaid programs. We would also try to make Medicare, I'm uh, sorry, Medicaid humane. Medicaid is a, there's a very simple way to do this. Most of the people in Medicaid are now enrolled through managed care, Medicaid managed care. About I think it's about 80% coverage now in Medicaid managed care. 
Um, that's a new innovation compared to the original structure. That's probably an improvement over original Medicaid because in original Medicaid, very few physicians would en uh, enroll and provide Medicaid services. So you could get free care if you could find a doctor who would provide it. <laughs> Uh, but it, basically, you were shut out, you were shunted around from doctor to doctor in the Medicaid program. The managed care programs kind of solves that, but you have to go to a closed panel of medic managed care providers to do that. We would simply allow um, uh, Medicaid, we'd require Medicaid programs within states to offer a high deductible plan to their enrollees. That would solve the access problem instantly. What you would then have is the people in Medicaid would have uh, an affiliated uh, HSA plan, a uh, um, uh, savings plan. You'd fill that plan up uh, through state funds in proportion to their income, or in inverse proportion, obviously, to their income. And then they could, those enrollees could walk into any provider in their, in their territory and get care just like any other individual. They'd be indistinguishable from people with private insurance. Uh, there have been successful trials of this in Indiana and their power accounts in Arkansas, and it would be a wonderful improvement in uh, Medicaid to fix that. Okay, a breeze through now, part three. That's the end of our part two discussion. Part three is something for everybody. Uh, there's four quick parts to this. One is the gray tsunami uh, and how to deal with chronic care. Uh, so let's start with the gray tsunami. You've all seen these age pyramids. Uh, this is what it looked like in 1950. Um, I was born in 1943. Uh, you can see the narrowing in at the bottom of the pyramid. Those are you know, losses of birth and losses of life from the, from the World War II. Um, you've run that forward 50 years to 2000, and you notice that age pyramid has gotten probably appropriately a middle age spread. Um, in seven years, this it's is what... Childhood obesity, I think. Yeah, in seven years... Uh, in 2025, this is the forecast uh, um, uh, age pyramid. It's not a pyramid, it's a column, except it's normal column. It's actually like a graduation cap. The very up at the top is that wide band. That's 85 and over. Those are very expensive people. Um, that's a very frightening thing. And when you get out to 2050, I'll be dead by then, but our, all, most people in this room will be, but our children will have to confront this. This is a very scary age distribution. We have to find some way to deal with this. The workers to retirees, if you think about who's financing the social security system right now, um, when Medicare was created, it was about a 5.7 to 1 ratio of workers to retirees. Uh, just a few years ago, uh, it was down to 4.5. By 2050, uh, that's when the bottom right panel gets uh, into place, it's going to be about 2.88 to 1 workers to employees. And if you account for the extra cost of those over 85, it's uh, under that to about two and a third workers per employee. We can't continue financing Medicare system under payroll uh, systems under these conditions. We have to fix that. Uh, one solution is to open the immigration door. Uh, now, why is this important, uh, that upper age distribution? Because age manifests itself as chronic conditions. So the percent of the population with various chronic conditions, these come from Medicare data, uh, the under 65 population, most of them, that's the blue bar uh, uh, on the left of each of these groups. Um, most people under age 65 have zero or one chronic conditions and declining down to a, a small number. If you look at the other extreme, the purple bar on the right, that's people 85 and over, you see they have increasingly large numbers of chronic conditions. The older you get, the more chronic conditions you have. In fact, that's how age manifests itself in healthcare costs is you get more and more chronic conditions. I give you personal living testimony to that. <laughs> uh, I'm age 74 now and uh, I have more chronic conditions than I did five years ago by a lot. <laughs> um, so here's what happens with the cost in the right hand panel. In every one of these age groups you look at the cost of providing care for an individual. It's much more strongly related to the number of chronic conditions than it is to the age of the person themselves. Uh, uh, high age people with low numbers of chronic conditions are not very costly. So chronic conditions is the story. It's the only story in controlling healthcare costs. We can't do that with the current fee-for-service system. The fee-for-service system is designed to make it as hard as possible to care for chronic conditions, particularly multiple chronic conditions. 
Uh, most elderly people have a lot of them. Uh, most of the elderly people live in regions where they have a special, well, at least one specialist for each of these. Some of them have specialists to deal with the side effects of the treatments that the chronic conditions doctors have provided, and we need major experimentation to find out ways to reform patient, uh, patient care in this. Uh, the other thing we need is a major reform in the way the NIH <coughs> um, focuses its budget. This is some extraordinarily important work from Fulgi McGinnis in 1990, replicated again in 2000 data by McGin uh, uh, Mokdad and colleagues. <clears throat> if these are the actual numbers of deaths associated with various behaviors. So if with tobacco, for example, they add up all the excess deaths from cancer, lung, uh, all sorts of cancers, uh, COPD, uh, heart disease, they add up all the excess deaths associated with tobacco, and that's what shows up as the number of deaths attributable to tobacco. Next on the list, and increasing rapidly over that 10-year period, is obesity. And when somebody does this again uh, using 2010 data, uh, obesity will overtake tobacco as the leading cause of death in our country. Uh, excess alcohol abuse is third, um, and you wander down the list. These conditions, which are essentially all human behavior account for over half of the deaths in our country every year and in parallel costs of medical care. In contrast, in stark contrast to this, this graph shows the NIH funding associated with these causes of death. Remember, the NIH is focused on individual disease types, cancer, heart disease, uh, and so on. If you look at the actual identification in uh, uh, NIH funding of money attributed to, to tobacco use cessation is over on the left, that little tiny red bar to associate with tobacco. The same is true with obesity and alcohol. The only big spike where there's a big difference is illicit drugs and sexual behavior. The sexual behavior is because the, a lot of the AIDS-associated uh, research is now categorized as associated with sexual behavior. We need to completely rethink how the NIH is spending its money to get on to prevention of these chronic conditions, most of which are related to our own behavioral choices. Quickly turning to fraud and abuse, estimates of uh, <clears throat> the total health care costs from Medicare and in the total system range from 5 to 20 percent of total health care costs. Uh, if you want to take a simple average of the numbers we have in the book, it's about $1 out of 8 in our health care system is fraud. Most of it is perpetrated by providers. Um, the current mechanisms for doing this is to pay the bills and then try to chase down the fraudulent actors, pay and chase. Um, observably, since we have this great extent of fraud, uh, this has almost zero effect on uh, preventing fraud. You get an occasional headline where some ring has been busted that had six doctors in it. This is a silly way to go about it. The solution is to follow the financial services sector and get mandatory pooling of uh, all claims data in a common format, private plans plus Medicare plus Medicaid, an instantaneous concurrent review of bills, uh, identify and prosecute is just exactly the same as what banks do when they pool credit data. Uh, so when you get that call from your credit card company, said, did you make that call? That's online active. The same thing can happen to deter fraud and abuse in healthcare. You have to get common data from every insurance coverage scheme to do this, and you need to have Medicare lead the way to make this happen. No individual provider can afford to do this on their own, no insurance provider. Another electronic issue is truly shared health insurance records. We now have widespread of electronic uh, health records now with a big boost in federal dollars uh, uh, from st stimulus money after the Great Recession. How much of these are shared across providers? Very little, almost none. So as a result, we have lower quality of care, we have duplication of testing, we have drug-drug interactions, which can be incredibly dangerous and lethal and costly, and we have higher costs and lower out care and uh, uh, lower quality of care and more deaths than we would if we had high sharing. How do we fix this? Again, really simple. Follow the financial ser services sector. Patients would specify a trusted third party, would aggregate all of the records, um, from their medical providers, you probably need a law uh, requiring providers to put this into the common data bank, um, otherwise they will resist. Uh, who would do this? It could be large insurance plans, it could be Google or Amazon, uh, uh, a large hospital change. Uh, 
patients individually would specify who has the permission to uh, alter these records or read them. Uh, and you would have an act, active industry emerging not only to provide access to these records, but people providing advice about what all these things mean. Uh, here's an example in the financial sector. This is my, worth, my wealth portal, uh, which aggregates every financial transaction I have. It has concurrent credit card information, all banking information, all of my investment portfolios all pooled into the same place. I have to give permission for them to read and write into this. And I have financial advisors that can look at this and tell me what's the best way to manage my investments. The same thing would happen in healthcare. All we need is Medicare leading the way again. Finally, I want to touch on an itch that's bothered me for decades. Uh, a year ago, uh, I had cancer surgery at the U UC San Francisco Hospital. I'm fine, thank you. Didn't even have to have chemo or radiation. Um, hospital billed me $144,000. My insurer, which is a Medicare Advantage Part C plan, approved $22,000. I had to pay $1,200 for this. Why do they bother issuing the $144,000 bill? And the answer, I think, is, is quite simple. I'll come to that in just a moment and how to fix it. But these large bills, some people think they actually have to pay them when they get these and they don't have insurance. So you have bankruptcy filings, you have credit card ratings that are called cratered. You have a very false picture of what healthcare costs are and potentially even people that commit suicide because they can't figure out how to deal with these bills. Why do they do it? And the answer is to justify charitable care write-offs. Um, if you go back and look carefully at the tax code, hospitals do not automatically qualify for 501c3 tax exempt status. They have to justify it with charity care. There's an implicit rule that says they've got to give away 5% of their services as charity care. It's a lot easier to do that when you're pricing it at $144,000 instead of $22,000. And so I think primarily they're doing this to justify large write offs, and the same is true for for profit because it's bad debt care then. They can write that off against their profit stream. So the solution to this is a simple administrative fix. Just have the IRS state a rule that says the maximum charitable uh, uh, deduction or bad debt write-off is the larger of whatever your Medicare or state Medicaid program would pay. All the logic for these absurd prices would vanish, and I predict these lists will vanish as well, and we'll have a much clearer picture of what's really going on in our healthcare system. <clears throat> so as a quick bonus to finish off, this is not a part of the book. I've been asked repeatedly in the course of my travels around the country, what would I do about the Affordable Care Act? Repeal it, replace it, repair it, uh, throw a stink bomb into it, uh, what would I do? And uh, the answer I'll give you in just a moment, but I want to be very clear, this is not in the book and I'm not implicating my co-author Steve Perini in any of what follows. <laughs> it's very important you understand, this is Phelps speaking now. <laughs> uh, Bernie Sanders has advocated Medicare for all. I agree with him except for one word. I would say, let's do Medicare Advantage for all. What does Medicare Advantage for all mean? We have income-related vouchers for everybody in the country. Uh, we'd alter the precious metal standard in ways I discovered, uh, I discussed earlier. Uh, I'd maintain the pre-existing condition rule and I'd reinstate the individual mandate. Uh, and I'd use something like a, a HDHP plan as the minimum required standard to uh, replace, and I'd have income-related fill-ups uh, associated with the uh, Medicaid population and perhaps even Medicare population. And uh, if anybody asks me, I'll try and fill out the details. So thank you for your attention. That's all I have to say. Thank you very much, Chuck. Uh, you've uh, given us uh, quite a lot on which to chew during your discussion of the individual mandate. I myself was snacking on some broccoli. It was a very small <laughs> crown, though, because the mandate isn't that large. It doesn't take that long to get it down. So here's uh, his broccoli. He's not kidding. <laughs> actually, the gag reflex usually overcomes me at that point. Uh, our, uh, our primary discussant uh, will be Mark Hall, uh, who's the director of the Health Law and Policy uh, Program and Turnage Professor of Law at Wake Forest University. 
Uh, Mark is written widely. Uh, Mark, you, you have a, actually, you have a textbook or a casebook uh, for health law as well, don't you? Yes. Yeah, yeah that's all. We're getting all credits here. Yep, so yep, yep. if you don't learn put enough it, on health economics, you put, want to learn health law, put, you can put in your pick plug. up, uh, get, you know, get those markets. Five people buy these books, I believe, is the way the <laughs> textbook market works at a large uh, premium. Yeah, and everybody else just rips it off. But it's a good market if you can make it work. Uh, now, uh, I really, literally learned health insurance regulation from Mark's work in the 90s when I had to figure out how this stuff actually came about. He pulled down a great book he did for AEI and worked since then. Uh, now, Mark developed a social conscience after that point. I had to check out at that point. But uh, on, on the, uh, the way in which uh, health insurance and states operate in terms of regulation, Mark is just uh, the other gold standard uh, in this area. He teaches also in the Wake Forest uh, graduate uh, programs for bioethics in the MBA program is on the research faculty at the medical school. Uh, Mark is it uh, in, in, in casual Thursday mode because he went to extraordinary lengths to get here, uh, which we do very much appreciate. So Mark, your thoughts on uh, Chuck's work and, and larger issues. Well, thank you, Tom, and thank you uh, also, Bob. Uh, is here and and uh, Bob Helms, who first got me into doing this work and and uh, gave me the opportunity and and uh, you know you sort of learn by doing and uh, I've had many opportunities over the years to to do things together with the two of you and uh, and, and AI and so I, I I've learned a lot doing this and learned a lot from this book and so I am in casual mode because I'm coming off of a week long vacation in the Caribbean I'm sorry but uh, I had to suffer to get here because I had to. Uh, I, I thought I could get home and change uh, clothes and get up here this morning, but due to the weather and travel plans, I had to uh, jump ship literally in, in Miami and uh, come here in my Caribbean garb. And this was the, the nattiest, uh, nattiest uh, attire I could find. I, I was desperately he, looking he for... He also has these Caribbean tan, I want you to Yeah, I, I was uh, desperately <laughs> looking for a tie to buy in, uh, in the Miami airport, which has an incredible number of stores, but apparently no one in Miami buys ties because, uh, <laughs> and um, so, so uh, uh, here I am and, and I mean to show no disrespect, if I have ut utmost respect for the book and uh, Chuck's uh, body of work and uh, uh, this kind of book that sort of draws together thoughts over a whole sort of distinguished career. You know, we're seeing a number of these now uh, as health economists become more, quote, distinguished. Uh, mm, older. <laughs> and so it, it sort of, you know, brought along on the on the vacation and thought, well, you know, we'll see. But, uh, you know, and, and yet another account of why, you know, the tax preference for health insurance is the wrong, you know, I, you know, I was long since convinced of that. But uh, I was immediately impressed by how uh, prescriptive this is as well as analytic. I mean, the title, can't judge a book by its cover or its title. The title, I think, undersells the book. It uh, seems uh, sort of purely analytic, uh, the health uh, economics of, uh, the economics of health policy but is, is a sort of a carefully thought out, well sort of reasoned, well expressed set of uh, prescriptive uh, proposals of this sort that you've uh, just heard uh, that I think is very, very impressive, uh, all with the theme that uh, Chuck uh, and, and his, uh, what's his name, uh, uh, co-authored, what's his name we'll call him, uh, that uh, <laughs> expressly said, it, it ties together under, under the notion of, of incentives, getting in, the, we, we got off on the wrong path with, with incentives due to the tax, tax exclusion and, and it, you know, the original sin led to other sins. Uh, and how can we write the, those incentives and, and thinking systematically through the public and private sectors uh, with regard to, to incentives. And so um, in doing so, uh, you know, a number of sort of points of conventional wisdom, if you will, in the, in the field of health economics that, that we repeatedly need to be reminded of, but a lot of really, I, I think, insightful, creative ideas that I haven't seen before, I haven't seen so well expressed before, uh, uh, and, uh, most of which you've heard summarized, but a few additional tidbits that are in the book uh, that haven't been. And so um, in doing so, you, this type of sort of very detailed, comprehensive, prescriptive work, you always open yourself up for criticism. And of mm -hmm. course, as a commentator, my job is to, you know, poke at it a little bit and show that, oh, well, if I had written this, which I didn't, <laughs> I might have, you know, done this a little differently and what have you. And so I'll say at the beginning, as I go through that process, uh, the great majority of the book I absolutely agree with. I mean, part three, uh, you know, at, down the line, check, 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 yes, 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 part, uh, the, the part with, you know, something for everyone. Part two, um, uh, many, many good ideas, a couple that I don't uh, fully understand yet, perhaps, or, or want to know more about. 
Uh, but part, part one um, is the one where uh, I, I think, uh, I, I, think uh, I want to think about some more and really talk about it. And what I admire about part one, which is the, uh, you know, going for the, uh, whatever it is, the, the whole hog or the Grand Slam or the Hail Mary, whatever, get, just, just get rid of the tax preference and go back to a uh, state of nature where <laughs> we don't have that. And then how do we make that transition and what would the world look like? Uh, few, if any, have been that so bold as to really, really propose that. And, you know, we hear about capping the exclusion and, you know, the Cadillac tax and, uh, you know, excise approaches and conversions to credits and things like that. Other ways of, of moving in that direction, but just starting more or less from scratch on that is, uh, is bold, ambitious, uh, completely unrealistic. Uh, <laughs> uh, but uh, I love it, you know, as an academic to really think through what would the world look like. And to sort of pre present that, you know, alternative universe, um, and, and and to see uh, uh, could things work that way, um, and who knows, maybe maybe it is feasible. I mean, one thing I say when people propose big, bold, ambitious ideas that seem very appealing is uh, that would be great uh, if we'd started out that way. But now that we are where we are, uh, I wouldn't want to really see the set of social, economic, and political conditions that might make that realistic. <laughs> because, uh, and I say that to the single payer advocates. Okay, well, I can see your points about single payer, but, you know, how are we really going to, you know, to get there, you're going to have to have some type of, you know, economic and political collapse that, you know, changes the cards. I sort of feel that way also about getting rid of the tax. I don't know what the actual real politic, uh, real economic conditions were that would bring that about. And so I, I, I fear for you know, sort of post, uh, you know, uh, something, you know, Korea or something. <laughs> Maybe I, I, I hate to be that ap apocalyptic about it, but the point is to change, uh, you, you know, to go uh, against that many sort of vested interest and sort of institutionalized uh, patterns and practices um, uh, requires a, a type of upheaval sort of circumstance, and and uh, that might come about someday. Uh, but I'm not sure uh, I, I want to see things get that bad. <laughs> so that's sort of the real pessimistic view of it. Still, thinking through how does it look, uh, how would it work, uh, I think is, is a wonderful uh, approach and, and, and could well lead to a, a Medicare Advantage for All type of uh, approach uh, that, that, uh, that reworks things. So, uh, so let's think about that. And, and the issue here is, you know, employer-based health insurance uh, supported by the tax subsidy is... Uh, uh, has lots of problems, um, but so does everything else. And so, you know, as Churchill said about democracy or whatever uh, other analog, you know, it, it, it's the worst possible except for potentially all the others. So you want to understand, you know, what are the other problems and, and, and check lays out, you know, well, let's look at uh, how uh, life insurance works. And that gives us a sense, a sense of how health insurance might work without the tax preference. Um, but I think of another example, which is uh, long-term long-term care insurance also mm -hmm. doesn't receive the, the tax subsidy. Uh, and that works pretty miserably. <laughs> I mean, it's very hard to keep that market even alive in the attempts in the, what was called the Class Act to try to really uh, you know, undergird that market and, 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 and make it more functional um, completely failed because the, you just couldn't mm -hmm. solve the, the equation. That it was necessary to make the incentives and the benefits uh, attractive enough for people to buy into it at, at a point in time where there's not adverse selection. And that's a different set of issues uh, because the nature of the consumption and, and everything is different. Yeah. But it, you know, it gives me a little pause to say, well, I'm sure things could work out. So I, I want to think a little bit more about how things, what, what would need to happen to make it work out in, in terms of the types of regulations that I am familiar, more familiar with. I'm not very familiar with either uh, life insurance or necessarily long-term care insurance, but I am with, with uh, the non-group market, as, as Tom alluded to. And so I've always thought of uh, market reforms of the type that um, Chuck said we would still need, individual mandate and some type of, uh, of, 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 of uh, uh, you know, packaging of benefits, uh, not, the, uh, uh, not the gold uh, pl silver plan, but we call it the, the Goldilocks plan, the, <laughs> the too rich, the too lean, the right, just right in the middle, mm -hmm. we, could, we could call it. So, but still some type of standardization, uh, rules about uh, covering pre-existing conditions, I presume some rules about community rating, mm -hmm. uh, otherwise you know, people are priced out and, and all the like. Typically I think about those rules as attempting to replicate 
what already happens naturally uh, in the employer market. Um, uh, we want to make the small group and individual market look as much as possible like the large group market, lower uh, you know, overhead cost, uh, uh, you know, sort of a natural pooling, uh, you know, spreading uh, that way, uh, uh, a variety of other features. And, and so to say that you know, raises two points. One is that if we have less dependence on, on the employer market or you can move sort of seamlessly between employer and, and non-group without uh, a tax penalty. You have to make sure that, that um, this uh, uh, non-employer market is, is working well. Um, and so what does that entail? Well, it entails having to make decisions about a lot of uh, contentious and con controversial things that are sort of dealt with uh, without even a thought in the employer market for the most part. So employers, uh, because it creates a natural sort of grouping uh, that is uh, independent of any individual's uh, you know, anticipated health needs, uh, solves the adverse sel selection problem from the get-go. You know, employers purchasing as a health benefit and not because they're thinking, what, what are my health consumption needs this year or next year? Uh, because they're covering a large group, they tend to cover a comprehensive set of benefits, so you don't have to worry about they're excluding maternity, they're excluding mental health, they're, you know, all these sort of things, all of which have huge you know, public health uh, externalities, uh, public goods aspects to them. Uh, so once you move out of that market, you've got to start to mandate that stuff. Um, and, and so the book doesn't really talk about the essential health benefits aspect of the regulation, but that's, that's hugely contentious and would become even more so if that became more uh, prominent. Think also of community rating. There's sort of a natural, you know, age redistribution within the employer pool that uh, this uh, w would be unpacked by this rate schedule that that that, that, um, uh, that Chuck talked about. And that uh, unpacking may produce economic advantages in terms of sort of accurately pricing things and and, and the like. But that too becomes controversial. So you, it, you can come up with. Uh, an age-based uh, recalculation of the of the attributed amount from the employer, if it's life insurance, because that's just what the actuaries use. But if it's health insurance, that becomes much much more con uh, uh, controversial, and 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 uh, you know something uh, as as uh, um, central as community rating becomes big, highly contentious in the non-group market, but it's done. Uh, almost without a thought, uh, due to the tax rules, because uh, the tax rules require it that way, but in, in the group market. So you're giving up a lot of things that sort of seem to work uh, well in the sense of what I take uh, Chuck and what's his name, uh, co-author, <laughs> to want to preserve in a, in a less employer-centric market. But uh, preserving those things becomes a, a somewhat heavier uh, lift than I, I think um, we might first uh, realize. Um, and so, with that in mind, I, I guess uh, I am, you know, very uh, open to uh, moving in that direction because I'm thoroughly convinced by the distorting effects of the, of the tax. Uh, but I, I want to sort of, as we do that, keep in mind the aspects of the employer-based market mm -hmm. that, uh, principally, this ability to create a co cohesive group uh, uh, that um, is purchasing for non. Uh, health consumption related purposes, the adverse selection problem. Um, uh, the, uh, the economies of scale, we can deal with that. Uh, um, uh, but then sort of uh, making those decisions more uh, regulatory decision, I think, could, could, could produce a lot of uh, uh, more contentious issues around the types we've already seen. Um, so those are my quick reactions. Again, sort of really admiring the idea, but wanting, and, and, and I, I meant to allude to a, a work uh, I did on this with David Hyman, another uh, Chicago-trained, uh, economically, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, influenced uh, health lawyer, uh, which, which is true of me as well. David and I both went uh, to your grad school. Uh, wrote a piece uh, 15 years ago, two cheers for employer-based health insurance, where we thought through, you know, the problems of sort of the agency uh, cost, the fact that someone else is picking your insurance for you, and all the rest. Uh, yet still, you know, they're, uh, you know, uh, it's a mix of advantages and disadvantages. So it's, it's just not good old socialist me saying this, David Hyman, uh, we sort of came together to say, well, you, you could do a lot worse than this. Uh, not, not to say that this is the perfect uh, solution, but uh, it, it, it's, it, it's uh, uh, 
hard, well, I shouldn't say hard to improve on. It could, clearly could be improved on, but it, 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 I'm a little cautious about abandoning it altogether. So uh, moving on to the other things, I'll just say a couple quick remarks and then and let Tom weigh in and sort of maybe point us to some of the secondary points. Uh, uh, I just thought uh, I'm, I'm less versed in Medicare and Medicaid, but just some of these ideas were terrific. I thought um, varying the, the, the coverage the scope of benefits for uh, uh, you know, medical uh, hospital physician, Part A, Part B, just like we do for Part D, I think uh, is really an intriguing idea and it's in line with work that I've done several decades ago where Chuck also says we should, you know, you take a more cost effectiveness approach to determining what's medically appropriate and then uh, allow that to be used in, in setting coverage standards uh, and using uh, Medicare Advantage uh, Part C as, as a vehicle for doing that. So uh, I think that's a terrific idea and, um, uh, you know, sort of having, uh, as we do with the Part D formularies, uh, HHS just says we have to cover something that works for all the major you know, classes of care, but we're not going to tell you what you have to cover. Um, and, and you can ask for exceptions if what's covered uh, is, isn't adequate in the particular case. Uh, I think that could, uh, could serve as a great model. Uh, in part three is, is idea about uh, dealing with fraud and abuse, the notion of uh, looking to the financial services industry and again sort of you know, very creatively, thoughtfully, you know, this is not a new problem in other areas. Let's look elsewhere to see what works well and, and try to um, uh, adapt that I think uh, is, 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 is really uh, uh, terrific. So I um, come back to sort of wanting to congratulate um, Chuck and what's his name for, for putting this together and uh, uh, really uh, p doing some, some impressive, uh, uh, you know, thoughtful, creative, uh, carefully tailored, uh, prescriptive, uh, you know, uh, proposals. Uh, you know, and, and, and a set of ones that you don't have to take a uh, whole cloth as a bundle. You can, you, can, you can take the best ones and run with it and then continue to chew on the other ones. So uh, really enjoyed reading this, uh, even at the beach uh, and on the airplane. Uh, and uh, and uh, it, it, uh, it, it deserves greater respect than my attire uh, 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 lets on. So thank you. Tom? Thank you very much, Mark. Uh, I was not originally planning to be... Uh, providing comments on uh, this uh, extensive and very thoughtful work by uh, uh, Chuck and uh, Lord Voldemort. Uh, <laughs> however, give me a couple of minutes and I always find a few things to uh, find a few quibbles about, I suppose, uh, in keeping with the spirit of what Mark said, though. These are just at the margins trying to tweak out further the hows. And although this is a very detailed and denser book when you get into some of these items, it's always hard to convert what seems like a good idea into the difficulties of not only the political system, but simply actually the, the mechanics of pulling it together and what some trade-offs are. Uh, but I'd start off with recognizing that, you know, usually we think in, in tax policy, well, we don't, we don't think about this enough, but the, the general concept of, of dead weight loss we can also have a deadweight loss from tax subsidies, which is really what this main proposal is trying to strip off. Let alone the problems of excessive health insurance, it's the impulse to have even more of it through the way in which we subsidize health care that in effect creates additional inefficiencies. So we're paying more for something, but not getting the full value of it. There's a lot of other things in the healthcare system that go in that way, but certainly that, that, that comes also from the way in which we've, we've subsidized employer-based insurance. Uh, it's a little harder in terms of how to unravel and reallocate. Now, Chuck had some initial thoughts as to how to take, if the employers are still paying for insurance premiums, how to attribute that to income, as opposed to they could just give them cash, which is just as good as money, uh, or higher wages, and then it just goes right into the tax system. Uh, we have some other default settings that might work on that front. You've seen this with the Cadillac tax, which eventually may ever come about, although I wouldn't count on it. Uh, and so they use mostly a, a COBRA rule, which is because of the nature of the employer group market, which at least officially 
everybody's paying the same premium, although there are exceptions to that under the table uh, or in different indirect ways. Uh, you can basically say everybody has attributed that premium the same way without getting into the age distinctions. That's certainly true in terms of their, their share of the premium mm -hmm. in, in, in most firms, although there's some exceptions on the basis of income in rare circumstances. Uh, and that's because of the, the rules for employer group markets that basically pretend that everybody has community rated mm -hmm. and so it's paying the same thing. But there's other attributions which when you try to, you know, when you re unwind what is already embedded and try to make everybody whole again, <laughs> which we can't do with tax reform, but you also can't do with redistributing this. Because even trying to reallocate the marginal rates relative to the share of the subsidy compared to the total uh, base of that income, different people take different takes out of the insurance market. Higher paid employees working for better firms are going to get richer insurance as well as, in effect, a larger tax subsidy. Uh, so it's hard to totally you know, have to reassemble the eggs after they're broken. So it's close enough for government work. We've also got uh, a lagging uh, reporting on employer group uh, premiums on W-2 forms. If you're a large enough employer, file 250 or above, although it's hard to find the date on that thus far. Uh, so those are kind of like the, the, the crude proxies for trying to make things uh, partly whole again. Um, <clears throat> I said to Chuck beforehand, I want to talk about the Revenue Act of 1942 as a better <laughs> model for tax policy. That was just a year before we screwed everything up, I'll point out. And it's almost an invert, well, you saw that in, in this version of tax reform, <clears throat> there was an effort to get rid of the medical expense deduction, at least in the House, and put it back in the Senate, which is the nature of tax reform policy. But once upon a time, a year before the employer group tax exclusion, the way we used to treat uh, health insurance was that actually, it, at that time, the first 5% of your adjusted gross income was excluded from being deductible. And so you could only deduct the amount above that. This is as an individual. And there was a dollar cap on top of that, which people forget about. It was 2,500, I believe, for a married household, 1,250 for an individual. Now this actually got boosted and changed later on, I think in the 65 uh, tax legislation, where they went to three, the, the threshold was above 3% of adjusted gross income for the uh, itemized uh, deduction. And uh, the, uh, the amount actually went up to $10,000. These got changed later on and got moved around in 86, et cetera. So that's that's a different model, which we'd basically say you don't come to the tax trough for subsidies until you've had enough to spend. And the old calculations were that was roughly above where the average person was back in the 1940s for what it could spend. It's a different model than trying to do it through the employer group base. And you can do some other tweaks on it. I once dragged Jim Capretti into that in a footnote in a paper we wrote, which the world will little note or long remember is another model for tax reform. Um, on the uh, individual mandate. Um, there are other ways to deal with that intersection mm -hmm. of wanting to provide protection for pre-existing conditions and having an alternative individual mandate, mm -hmm. not well articulated by office holders or people running for mm -hmm. uh, office. Uh, but it was a combination of, uh, in the earlier version of this year, uh, continuous coverage incentives, mm -hmm. building off the HIPAA base, and then having to supplement that gap with some type of subsidized coverage, which is normally high risk pool. You could do it through invisible uh, reinsurance or invisible mm -hmm. risk pools. Uh, but that's a different way to do it. And then some period of time in which you're at risk, but not at maximum risk until you would in effect requalify by getting coverage. Uh, an even more exotic concept, because in, in people who read through the book in detail, you place a lot of emphasis on uh, genetic risk. Uh, and that being the trigger for uh, chronic conditions, and therefore, once you're there, you need you know you're you're in deep trouble, and and we need an individual mandate around that. Uh, there's a proposal from 20 years ago, former intern of mine, for genetic risk insurance, mm -hmm. where you could preposition uh, to basically before you know that you have risks. Uh, buy insurance against that. So there's a way to compartmentalize. The markets worked in areas of mm -hmm. genetic risk as well. So there are other ways to skin the cat, but we often gravitate toward the simpler way because that's how we do things politically, I suppose. Uh, a quick aside on the constitutional law, which Mark once dragged me into uh, years ago uh, before uh, the uh, ACA materialized. Necessary and proper gets you part of the way. 
It doesn't get you the entire way because you still need an underlying power in order to have a, a commerce uh, power mm -hmm. exercise. You can tax, though, which is what we ended up doing. Uh, but I think that that might be a little bit of a stretch under the, uh, the Constitution if you buy into the way in which the court found that there was the problem in terms of uh, the, uh, the Commerce Clause. No, no, he's right on that, Tom. He's, he got it right. <laughs> it may be proper, but it's not necessary, because you can do it other ways. Uh, right. Well, let me move on. Uh, right. that, that's from Tom Jackson, who's a constitutional lawyer and clerked for Scalia. So. Right. And there are plenty yeah, of other lawyers Rainforest. who also clerked for Scalia, no, who said otherwise. So that's anyway, correct. That was Tom Jackson. We can go through that. By uh, University. Medicare taxes. Uh, I'm not sure uh, how you would get all the way and, and be able to match it up for the, the Part A taxes. You've got a disconnect between the people paying the taxes and those receiving the benefits. People move around. So you try to regionalize the, the payers relative to the beneficiaries. It can work with the Part B premium and the C and D premiums, mm -hmm. but I think it's a little bit more of a mismatch between who's paying in as opposed to who's receiving it. Uh, in a similar vein, most you know, three-fourths of Part B is still done through income taxes. Mm -hmm. Would you regionalize people's income taxes in order to have that direct line of uh, you know, uh, uh, connection? Um, on the Medicare Advantage uh, scope of benefits, another important reason, once upon a time, for why they said that the baseline for uh, Medicare Advantage had to have the same basic benefits as part. This is the old competitive bidding construct, which is if you're bidding off of the same base, you have to have something in, in common as opposed to, mm. well, we think this is, might be an actuarial equivalent mm. alternative. Maybe you could get there. Uh, in the premium support days, though, that explains why they started with that as the, the, the common b base of benefits, I think. Um, I'm always a little uncomfortable with uh, dealing with the Medicare supplement problem by using the, the quick tool of just taxing it. Uh, it's more complicated. We do have Medigap regulations, which have been gradually chipping away at the <laughs> absolutely nothing down in order to get your policies. And we, we've taken some of those most extreme uh, uh, cost enhancing policies off the market. And if you believe that that's the problem, the, the simplest way is say you simply can't buy those policies uh, and then deal that with as a matter of benefits regulation, I would think, uh, to, to deal with that rather than having another tax on top of a tax in order to then redistribute it in, in, in some other manner. A uh, couple of other uh, quick things. Uh, chronic conditions, which we didn't get into very much. You're at the back end of those chronic conditions. Once they've arrived, and it's the installed base of all the chronic <laughs> conditions are there, how we can medicalize them and treat them a little bit better, although there's some skeptical uh, recent empirical findings whether or not, for instance, the people in the Medicare ACOs are actually focusing on the people with chronic conditions <laughs> in order to do their economies, and whether the coordination means a lot remains a little bit uh, questionable. Uh, but there's a front end to this, and this is some of your work in terms of behaviors uh, and some of the restructuring of NIH, but you need to go even earlier because there's a long line of literature which suggests most of those chronic conditions <coughs> happen much earlier in life, the seeds of them, and you know all that work, mm -hmm. in terms of in utero and, and, and the way in which that, that shows up 40 or 50 years later. So we're way behind the curve, <laughs> but if we want to actually bring those down, we're going to have to start today for one of those decade later costs in order to head them off. That's the true prevention, as opposed to how to treat them somewhat better uh, as, as the residual uh, of that. Uh, actually, Mark's done some work on this, but didn't talk about it, the alternative uh, large, uh, to large medical bills. Mm -hmm. uh, there's actually a, a new article out, uh, I think one of the law journals, talking about uh, dealing with that in the network to just simply have the default situation be it's the Medicare payment if you didn't contract for it beforehand. Mm -hmm. And you, you drive the disclosure requirements by basically saying, if people didn't know that they were going out of network and they get hit with this bill, it defaults back to whatever the, the, the lower payment is. Uh, and the out of network side of it is just as important as right. the, uh, the, the uninsured side. Um, finally, on uh, job lock, a uh, hobby horse of mine because it's one of those things that's asserted without being proven for a long period of time. The deeper literature in this area has tended to find this big wave of entre entrepreneurial activity by people at 65. 
Uh, but if you want to get entrepreneurs who are going to produce very much, you want to deal with the younger. And I think the actual evidence of uh, sizable job lock, as opposed to people who have better jobs get better benefits, and therefore you want better jobs and don't want to leave them behind, uh, is more dominant. So I think it's a little bit on the uh, overstated side as a driving force for policy change. Having said all of that, this is a really important book. A long line of work that is summarized in a great way, and I think it's uh, an another tour de force. So congratulations. Thank you, Tom. Thank you. Now, we have room for uh, and time for some questions, and we do appreciate the hearty audience uh, that came here today through uh, not gloom of night, but I guess yeah, sleet and snow sleet or and whatever. Snow or inhale, right, yeah. right. Let's start off with uh, Paul Ginsburg. Normally, uh, when I bring the microphone, I identify yourself. Uh, Pretend it's a question rather than an essay. Sure. And go yeah. ahead. This is Paul Ginsburg, the Brookings Institution in USC. Uh, Chuck, you said a lot of really interesting things. I certainly agree with you about how important the problem with tax treatment is for employer-based health coverage. But I don't have the confidence that you have in our political system's ability to foster a viable individual market. You know, just what we've seen in both the years of getting the ACA to work better and then the repeal and replace debate last year, it almost seems as though our politicians are unwilling to actually force people into a pool. And, uh, you know, we see so much as far as allowing healthy people to get out of this pool. So, so I've come to the conclusion that despite its problems, I think we need to cap the tax uh, exclusion I don't think we want to eliminate it because I think we want to keep employers in this game for quite a while longer. I think it'll make a big difference to have a meaningful cap as far as and th just the fact that employers, when they expected the Cadillac tax to uh, take effect, they really were doing things. So that's the direction I'd go. So let me ad address this with uh, and also to, Mar to Mar Mark Hall's commentary as well. Uh, I, I have a, a very high degree of confidence that employers will continue to offer health insurance broadly to their employees uh, without the tax subsidy. The, the reason for this is because of the enormous efficiency in the economy of scale of underwriting through a large group. And we have m multiple sources of evidence for belief of that. The insurance, life insurance market to which I alluded is, is one of those. But all you have to do is look at the health uh, insurance coverage in most industrialized nations around the world, and you see this is exactly what's going on without the tax subsidy. Germany, Japan, which mimicked Germany in many ways, most European nations have employer-based insurance coverage. They also have regional insurance. They have labor union insurance. Employer coverage is rampant across the industrialized world without the tax subsidy. I can't see any reason in the world why that's not going to happen in the United States as well. So I actually don't share your pessimism on that, uh, on that issue, uh, both to Mark, Mark and uh, to Paul. I think there's strong reason to believe, to the contrary, there's strong reason to believe that they will continue this insurance. It will just be a different type of insurance because it's not subsidized. And coming back to the question about, that you raised, Tom, about the the mechanism for redistribution. I think the private market is very likely to have age-related premiums. That's why I want to have an age-related return of, you know, uh, of income to employees, and by far the least litigative way to do that is have the IRS publish a table like I showed. So that was very pragmatic decision on, on, on our part to say, let's get the IRS to publish a table that gives the age gradient They'll return the money, and then you're worried, Mark, that they won't have the, they'll have the money in their hands to buy that insurance, and they'll be able to buy it at the same efficient rate through the groups. They'll just have different offerings from the employers. So I, I, I'm, I'm not concerned about those issues at all, either one of them. I may be wrong, but, you know, that's my, my current analysis. Back to Sarah. Sarah Hansard with Bloomberg Law. Um, I remember at one of the congressional hearings, a small a broker who worked with small companies said he was not at all confident that if, if he didn't have the employer mandate, which he didn't think was a good idea, that the employers would give that money to employees. Why do you think that they necessarily would give the money to employees? Oh, actually, the there's been some important natural experiments on that. Uh, they're reported in our book. 
Uh, perhaps the most prominent of these is some uh, work that John Gruber reported, uh, an economist from MIT in Chile, where there's a major change in Social Security law uh, and the employment, and, and very rapidly the money that was being paid by employers uh, in Social Security payments was returned to employees when the law changed and the employers were eliminated those obligations. It's a natural market equilibrium outcome, and the evidence on that, uh, where we have a clear a clear test of it, the evidence is quite strong that the money will flow to the, uh, flow to the employees. In the case of the you know, uh, Chile and uh, the, in the employer insurance premium uh, uh, social security pay payments, uh, the, the money was, was transferred to employees very rapidly. No, no, no. They just changed the law. It says the employers are no longer obligated to do this, and market equilibrium forces forced the, the you know, basically it, it was a, it's a natural market equilibrium. I'm, I'm quite confident of that outcome. We're, we're kind of missing Mark Pauly on this issue in particular because right. he's right. done extensive right. Right. Mark on this. Right. Mark Pauly is the, is the master of this in studying the... The uh, employers like to believe it's their money, but ultimately they do have to disgorge it uh, yeah. and, and pass it back. And, and again, it's just competitive. If you have competitive labor markets yeah. now, if you don't have that, you've got a okay. larger set of problems uh, that, 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 that fall into that. Uh, Mike? Thanks. Mike Miller. I'm originally a physician doing health policy for about 30 years, and I'm also the senior policy advisor for Healthy Women. And your, your construct is an interesting mix of market competition and broad mandates or regulations. Um, I wonder if you could comment about something specific in terms of requirements for covering preventive services and covering like maternity and prenatal, prenatal care. Sure. What your thoughts are on that? Yeah, the, 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 we didn't delve into this in the summary, but thank you. The, uh, the, we recommend, and uh, not just for uh, uh, the Medicare, but uh, for for all coverage plans, that you really have a careful focus on on essentially bypassing coinsurance and deductibles for for key preventive services. Okay. Now, I. I, I, I I think that, first of all, partly my wife's a pediatrician. <laughs> Let me explain some of my thinking on that. But I, uh, t to me, this is, uh, as a Chicago-trained economist, I'm very comfortable with these ideas because what, what you have here really is a, uh, a, a game theoretic problem where first movers lose. Um, it's just very hard to get an equilibrium outcome of this uh, un unless you mandate the outcome. Uh, uh, so th this is a case where I think the the, the natural market equilibrium fails, and that's why I would opt for a regulation that says you have to require that insurance plans give full coverage for uh, preventive services that have been identified as being uh, either cost saving or extremely low cost per quality or something like that. Uh, um, again, th th this is a little bit of a conjecture about how far you go down that pathway. Uh, vaccines are a, 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 an obvious case, for example. Actually, some vaccines don't actually save money, but they produce health benefits at an extremely low rate. But there's also a fair, there's some, some work cited in the, in the book that uh, d demonstrates how coverage uh, for people with chronic conditions, which is where I think the real storyline here is in this. People with chronic conditions that get off their meds because of deductibles and coinsurance end up being much more costly. And so uh, the, the natural market equilibrium there is to not cover, uh, and you just, I just think you have, to, uh, you have to get that coverage. It's kind of like requiring that drivers have uh, collision insurance uh, in order to get a driver's license. Um, you know, th th that's a, it's a spillover to other people. Uh, well, liability, not collision. Yeah, actually, li yeah. Right, li right, 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 liability. Um, we don't actually speak about maternity and prenatal care specifically, uh, and uh, I, I guess I, I haven't thought about them particularly. I was really focusing more on the chronic conditions question. Um, maternity and prenatal care, you have timing issues, you got, they're, they're not as, uh, you know, it's more of a personal choice about how much and when. Um, uh, so, Certainly, there's an enormous value. We, we know uh, the, one of the reasons why we have terrible maternity, uh, maternal outcomes, uh, uh, and Japan has the best in the world, is uh, Japan just pays a huge amount of attention to prenatal care. <laughs> 
And so I think if there was anything where you fit into my model of saying you really need to uh, mandate coverage, it would be prenatal care because there's just a demonstrable huge benefit in lifetime health outcomes and, and reduction of uh, health problems and reduction of health costs uh, for proper prenatal care. So I, I think if I'd, if I'd gone down that path specifically, I'd almost certainly agree that prenatal care should be in there. Um, and well, that, would, that would probably involve mater proper maternal care as well. That's though, again, trying to say everything has to be solved within the health insurance wrapper. There's a lot of funds that could be redistributed on a targeted basis to deal with isolating. We've done that to some extent in Medicaid, not well, to, to you know, raise the priority of, of a prenatal care. Mm -hmm. uh, it could be done through a larger, if you had a truly creative block grant and said what actually produces the best yields in terms of health outcomes, and you had policymakers who thought about that, they might right. want to retarget things and use social supports and other things yeah. than just saying, yeah. you know, is, is there a doctor who's going to right. see this person and is it an insured yeah. product? No, the, the, the way it works in Japan, as soon as you're pregnant, you've got workers in the neighborhood that come in and start talking to the mother about how to do this right, yeah. <laughs> sort of from month two on. Right. And it's not medicalized nearly so much there. But in the insurance market, the insurance world, there's a question of whether uh, you know, a 50-year-old male needs to have maternity benefits as part of his what's covered in yeah. And whether well, again, and and benefits it, to that broader coverage, well, or it, you segregate it and drive up the Yeah, no, in a, in a private... In a market such as we describe, you'd almost certainly see experience rating, and that would be one form of experience rating. You could, uh, and you see, you'd see, uh, you, you know, if you, uh, you'd see people putting in uh, maternal benefits for low, uh, lower age people, and the premiums would be higher. The question is, do you need to mandate that uh, by an age profile or something? I haven't thought about that completely. Well, mandates I, have worked out so well. Yeah, State yeah, legislatures yeah. in the past, I'm yeah. sure, it'd be done yeah. scientifically, and no politics yeah. involved. Uh, Bob. Yes, uh, Bob Helms, retired from AEI. Uh, one comment and then one question for Chuck. Uh, when I went out to the uh, National Archives at College Park and asked for the records of the War Labor Board, they wheeled out this large cart filled with large volumes of all the proceedings of the War Labor Board. And I was looking for two things, neither of which I could find. I was looking for some sort of serious discussion. Did anybody consider sort of the implications of not considering uh, fringe benefits as part of uh, uh, taxable income? It was a rule that had been adopted by the IRS. Meanwhile, the War Labor Board is just incredible when you look through the record all of the silly things that they were trying to decide to enforce wages. So it was very convenient for them to just sort of say, adopt the IRS rule and leave this alone. And uh, uh, the other thing I looked for was any evidence that they ever had a case involving the 5% rule. And I could hmm. not find that that was ever an issue that came up with them. Uh, but what happened when the War Labor Board was discontinued after the war, the 5% rule went away, and it was open-ended, which is still open-ended. So it's an open-ended tax right. subsidy, which gives everybody incentives to keep adding to it. Except in life insurance. Yeah, Taft. right. <laughs> and, it, and you make a good point, you sort of comparison with life insurance. And historically, it was such a flip, because the pre-Labor Board rule, which was to set a ceiling on how much you could get, was yeah. actually you had a threshold before you could get there. Yeah. So you just kind of went in, you know, under the exigencies yeah. of the time, and it got institutionalized. Well, now my question for Chuck. Uh, I have often quoted from your textbook uh, an estimate of the deadweight loss from the tax exclusion being, as I remember, 1.5 to 3 percent or something. It was a range of GDP. Mm -hmm. And so given your chart about premiums and evidence of increasing expenditures and so on, is there a any new estimate of, without getting into the technical discussion of what we mean by a deadweight loss, but is there any sort of new estimate of that? Uh, and it, the short answer is none that I know of. <laughs> uh, the, the I thought work, you had a 20% figure for well, the, part the, of it. Well, the work that Bob is referring to um, was a, 
some, uh, basically it's the, it's the multiplier effect of the subsidy on health insurance to the increased coverage on demand for care. And then the second layer is how much does that increase demand for care increase spending? And so you're levering yep. two demand elasticities, if you will, across that problem. One is the demand for medical care, which the Rand Health Insurance Experiment very carefully nailed down. And the second is, what is the demand for elastic, price elasticity of demand for insurance? And I would say that that question has total ambiguity in the economics literature. I've contributed uh, estimates that are at the larger end of those elasticities, and there are those that say that that elasticity is very small. Um, and there's, I know of no information that really nails that down carefully, Bob. So what that was basically is a little simulation model that layered out those two subsidy effects and said what would happen if you canceled the first subsidy of the insurance and there you have to guess about which demand for insurance elasticity you want <clears throat> and then you hit that again with the Rand Health Insurance Experiment elasticities and you get the numbers and they, you know, in, in round numbers it increases the size of the medical economy by 20 to 40 percent depending on which elasticity and, and at that time it was 10 percent of the U.S. economy, it's 18 percent now. <laughs> Um, so, but that's the, the problem, and, and you know, the short answer is I don't, I don't know of any updates to that work. Uh, I haven't done them myself, and I don't know of any. The bottom line is it's not trivial. It is certainly not trivial, um, and the, the, the larger problem which that work did not embed is the flow of new technologies. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you look at the work that Joe Newhouse has done, for example, back in the, in the early 80s on this, um, the flow of new technologies, once you get everybody with good health insurance coverage, stuff comes into the medical system if there's any observable benefit rather than saying does the benefit exceed the cost of producing it. And to me that technological change effect is, is the biggest one and that was not captured in those numbers. The market there's, technology doesn't move on an empty stomach. Right, uh, exactly. Uh, the, the, uh, we've the, got a patient uh, a, a, and, a, and a follow up right question I think here. Uh, Eric Ells with Consumers Checkbook. I was previously in the medical technology industry, and I feel like it's really glad to hear you talk about it because it's a key missing point in the whole debate, is do we want that? To what extent do we want it, and how should it be paid for? I'll just say as a comment, the company that I worked for got what you would call a Medicare subsidy by a favorable medical, a favorable rate ruling early on, which, as you said, was not based on dollars per quality. Um, so I, I wanted to ask, did you all look at any of the kind of ways that the private sector has tried to begin to deal with this, like risk sharing or you sure. know, do do dollars per quality in the quality in the private sector. Yeah. Um, and then, can you talk a little bit about the culture change that goes with that? Because people really like technology in this country. Yeah. Um, so, <laughs> this is a multi-layered question. And it'll give me a few minutes to give you multiple layers of it. Uh, I've actually done some digging into the question of how much people are using cost effectiveness in the private sector. And the answer is not very much publicly, but I think a lot back in the shadows. Um, there are uh, Supreme Court rulings that say uh, you can't sue an insurance company for withholding benefits under ERISA plans, which covers the employer market, but they don't apply to the non-employer markets. and. Uh, obviously, which would grow under our proposal, uh, and then you're into state law, which is much more uh, uh, plaintiff friendly, I would say, than, uh, than ERISA law on that. Uh, but there's not much going on in Europe either. I was just in a panel over in Glasgow at the ISPOR, the International Society for Pharmaceutical and Outcomes Research, uh, where there's a people from uh, several European nations also discussing this. It, actually, formal use of cost effectiveness is fairly minimal, except in Britain and the National, nice. uh, uh, National Institute for Clinical Effectiveness. So, uh, so, so that's part one of the answer is there's not a lot of it going on formally, but I think a fair amount informally, okay? Um, the second part uh, uh, of this deals with uh, the kind of the uh, do we have too much technology coming into the system? I think that was part of your question. Uh, I just finished, a, uh, we published uh, in early December a National Academy's report on affordable medication uh, uh, that, uh, are, by the way, my, the leader of that project, Guru Madhavan, is sitting in, front, uh, is sitting in the back of the room. <laughs> Um, and that's the, you know, in technology, uh, there's the sort of the focal point of it is in pharmaceutical, biopharmaceuticals and uh, the medical devices, some also, but that's really the central focal point of this. Uh, and it's an enormously complicated problem, uh, complicated uh, in the case of pharmaceuticals with the conference through our patent system of a, 
exclusive market rights for 25 years for drugs, more than we have for other products, uh, in exchange for federal regulation time delays to get onto the market in that sense. Uh, and that all is well and good until you uh, b bring in uh, massive health insurance coverage for prescription drugs, which did not exist at the time that the Orphan Drug Act or Hatch-Waxman or, uh, for that matter, Bidol came in in the early 80s. Uh, and so I just dug the numbers out of this. Uh, now over 90%, about 90%, I think it's 87 or 88 percent of prescription drug costs are covered by insurance, which means that any market constraints on that market have evaporated. So, so now what we have is a market where we have market, government granted market exclusivity and insurance coverage that's wiped away any semblance of, of a market, market equilibrium that we would normally think of. So this is not a free competitive market. This is a massively distorted market, uh, more so even than the primary health care system, which doesn't have this patent protection issue. So I think there's a huge issue involved in new technology development that we need to confront. That's quite an accomplishment, a market more distorted than the rest of the healthcare market. I'm impressed. Oh, it, it's massively so because of the patent, in yep. the intervention of the patent law. Uh, and the bargaining power is uh, so obviously. That, uh, what do you have in bargaining power in health insurance? You have individual insurance plans negotiate with providers. And they're primarily doing it in regions, you know, Denver or Salt Lake or whatever. They're, uh, they're negotiating providers in a given region who are essentially immobile, at least in the short run. So they've got good bilateral bargaining power. You don't have that in pharmaceuticals. So what do the insurance companies do in pharmaceuticals? They coalesce their bargaining power into, into PBMs. And so the largest health insurer has 13% of the market. Uh, the largest PBM has over a third of the market. And that's still a lot smaller than what other countries have in, in negotiating with the, these people. Two quick follow-ups. Did, did you all consider, I think that the Medicare price fee schedule in a lot of these sets a price floor for services? Certainly in the lab industry where I was, it did. Is, did you just look at removing that legal requirement or whatever the cause of that is? No, I don't think it's, I, I'm not sure it would set a price floor. I, I don't know enough about how those negotiations work, but I do know that when Medicare put in uh, in Part A, put in the prospective payment system. That program was widely and rapidly adopted by private sector, and it has radically changed the t hospital industry for the better. It shortened length of stay by 50 percent. Uh, it's and, and that, despite the outflow of of um, large amounts of ambulatory surgery, the easy stuff in the outpatient sector. Uh, and then Part B, the resource-based relative value system, again, uh, provided a completely different mechanism for paying physicians. So I, I think in this case, Medicare leadership has been really important in, in helping the private sector to move to more efficient payment systems. We have uh, some more questions, including right down here. Lou Gagliano, healthcare consultant. Uh, Two, two data points. Number one, uh, many of the programs that are, have been initiated under MACRA are changing the way healthcare is delivered for the better. Uh, second, 86% of our healthcare dollars are spent on chronic care issues. And I think we need to be careful about how we change the rules and incentives uh, to pay for those costs. And I would also say the, the rules or the uh, the history of ACOs hasn't been written. We're trying to change how people's behavior about their care is administered, and we need to look to some of the models that are working under ACOs, because they are. Their timelines are gonna be longer than some of our patients will provide us. But I wanna go back to the question on chronic diseases and to make sure to get your comments about how not to change some of the regulations you're talking about that would de-emphasize the workings in that sector. Yeah, the, the, I mean, our primary recommendation on uh, chronic care payment mechanisms, by the way, is we don't know anything about how those are working, so we have to get better information. <laughs> okay, I confess total ignorance on that. We don't know what works because uh, we've had no no incentives to experiment with different uh, mechanisms. The ACOs provide a little headway into that. They're very premature. They're fiddling around at the edges with stuff that's post-hospital care. We really haven't addressed the ambulatory care sector for chronic, you know, in the community chronic care in any way in the payment mechanisms. And there may be no other way to do that uh, in a comprehensive way other than a pure HMO that's, you know, capitation, capitated payments. Because uh, any time you carve out some chunk of stuff and say that's going to be capitated or partially capitated, 
you're always going to have a fight at the fringe about whether that patient is in that bundle or not. <laughs> and I, I, so to me, that's a very hard problem. And to do that, you need standardized data from these ACOs and other experimental, experimental forms that allow you to understand what they've actually done. So what we've recommended specifically a requirement for standardized data collection from these uh, things that uh, allows people to assess what actually works so that it's not just, you know, if you've seen one ACO, you've seen one ACO. Uh, we'll never learn anything from that, uh, from these demonstrations, unless you can systematize the parameters of what they're doing in an effective way. Uh, and it's a long struggle. Uh, so to me, the chronic care thing uh, is, and I said, we've, we've really emphasized also, and I think this is very important, um, when you get into particularly move to higher deductible plans, uh, which I actually like in general because they guarantee you risk protection at the top end. You know, that's sort of the extreme thing. What you really want from insurance is to make sure that at the, at the upper end of risk, you're 100% you're guaranteed protected. And that's, by the way, what Kenneth Arrow, who just passed away uh, in early uh, 2017, proved in 1963 is that the optimal insurance is full coverage above a deductible. Uh, so we're kind of quarreling about where the deductible should be when we say high deductible plan or not. But in that setting, I think you really do have to carefully attend to these, um, these treatments for chronic conditions where uh, you, you want the incentives to be for the long run, not for the short run. And, if you, uh, and so to me, bypassing the deductibles and coinsurance for, for chronic uh, conditions is, is a, a really central thing to figure out right. Uh, and that, I think that's going to increase because high deductible plans are by far the most rapidly growing plans. Um, brings me back, by the way, to a brief comment of yours, Tom, about the, uh, the, the Medigap pl plans and, get, and mm -hmm. getting rid of them. I think actually th they'll be the way the dinosaur fairly soon anyway. If you look at the enrollment in Medicare, you get this swooping increase in enrollment in Medicare Advantage plans. Um, mostly the people that are still on traditional Medicare are the people that came on when they signed up for it. <laughs> And so the, the flow of new people coming into Medicare is mostly going into Part C, now Medicare Advantage. And so I think eventually, and of course, if you're in Medicare Advantage, you can't buy a Medigap plan. So and essentially, Part C is a substitution for Medigap. I'd just like to accelerate that change, um, which I think will occur naturally. In the long run, we'll all be in Medicare Advantage. Uh, well, the, the, there, there, there you are. So, but anyway, I, I, we, we don't claim to have figured out how to do this, but we do say this is extraordinarily important to get it figured out, uh, both in terms of what the insurance coverage looks like and what are the payment incentives for providers on these. And particularly on that latter part, we don't know anything about how to do it right, and we just need systematic data collection across efforts so that we can begin to figure out what works rather than charisma of the leader. Uh, we do have time for a few more questions in back, Jim. Hi, uh, Jim Capretta with AI. Um, just a question on your proposal re regarding uh, trusted third parties. You mentioned uh, that you think Medicare needs to lead the way. I just kind of want to understand what exactly you would have it, Medicare do. I suppose the idea would be to, re through Medicare, require providers who are being paid through Medicare servicing Medicare. Yeah, that, that would be one way to do it. Uh, you may actually need legislation to... Uh, re require um, uh, providers to pass the records on to the trusted third party generally. So when I said in my brief notes here, I said Medicare leads the way. I think the federal government needs to lead, lead the way in general here. Um, if you look, uh, are at there the, barriers? I mean, yes, my understanding that there are some allowance of that already, but not well, enough to so consumers if you, demand. If you it. look at the way the American Medical Association, for example, describes medical records, they say they are the property of the physician. And they go on to say in their ethics code that physicians should provide either a copy or a summary of that to patients upon request. And obviously, I mean, what's happening right now is that your primary care physician is your trusted third party in some sense. Uh, so you've got, you know, my doctor sends me off to a referral and that, you know, the doctor getting the referral doesn't know much about my long history. And then my primary care doctor gets a summary of that back and maybe the images in current imaging technology, they get the actual images as well as the MRIs or something. But when you finish that, it's incomplete sharing, um, both in terms of, of the pathways and also the volume. And providers are very reticent to hand out this information. I think erroneously, um, you know, Mark Hall can probably speak to this more, but you're, I think, 
if you ask the lawyer for any doctor or hospital, they say, don't share those records, you might get a lawsuit. But in fact, I think a lot of lawsuits are filed so people can see the information. So it's not at all obvious to me whether malpractice suits would increase or decrease with this sharing. Fewer lawsuits are being filed lately than there used to be. But it's not so, I, I wanted to offer an idea on that. I was yeah. going to give it as a side comment, so I'm glad you brought it up yeah. as, as a primary one, which is uh, Kevin Schulman at Duke, at Duke and I worked on a paper a few years ago about uh, propertizing uh, uh, medical information uh, where it's the patient who owns the information. Now, the records in an embodiment may also be owned uh, in, in some, uh, so uh, by, by the provider, but essentially giving uh, patients the legal right to direct instead of uh, the government directing, the patient has this right, yes. and in, in a way that they can, they can be compensated. So you, you can then create what we call the HIPAA-free zone. <laughs> uh, a Google, who is not a, yeah. uh, what are they called, covered entity, uh, uh, or somebody could be in the business of aggregating this information and then and then doing doing things uh, with it, uh, where uh, you know uh, because the patient has an ownership right in that, uh, there's some small incentives to come back to them in the same way in which I get, you know, customer reward cards for sharing my purchasing information at the grocery store or whatever, um, or, or not exactly like that, but this is sort of a general concept that the, the rewards don't have to be large, but you know enough uh, that you have the right and, and can direct it. So. I, I, I don't know how uh, practical that, that idea is, but it, it, it's, it's a sort of, a, I think, creative use of, of property rights uh, that right. might get to uh, a less regulatory solution. Yeah, no, it, yeah. I, I, obviously, going back to one of my favorite professors ever, Ronald Coase, assignment of property rights is really important. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and I wasn't aware of that work, but if, I think if you could do this through a property rights mechanism, that would be great. Yeah. But right now, it's very clear that medical providers treat these records as their own property. Right, right, right. It and is. so to me, either you have to change the property right law, which is state by state, uh -huh. or you have to have a federal law that says, if the patient says you've got to send a copy of the records to Google, you've got to send a copy of the no, records no, to it's Google. An, it's a very interesting problem in property rights, and it, it creates it essentially an, an anti-commons. Usually, if you don't assign property rights, you create a, prob a right. commons problem. This, this by assigning it, you create a, an anti-commons right. problem, and, and so yeah. I'm, I'm yeah. how interoperability yeah. and meaningful use worked out so well. What could yeah, go wrong? yeah, yeah. Yeah, but the, the other problem with trying to do it through a property rights mechanism, it's state by state law, and with the uh, mobility of patients and uh, providers across states. Well, and you don't have to call I'm, it a property. You could just say patients have a right to yeah, X and, and, and can be yeah, compensated but, for it. But still, yeah. I, 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 I'm not trusting that providers will freely give out those uh, yeah, doc yeah, documents yeah, yeah, as yeah. patients specify unless yeah. you have a, a requirement that they do so. Yeah, in effect, yeah. what you basically put in is a federal law saying the patient owns the right to that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I, I just, but. I, I sort of glibly said Medicare has to lead the way here. I think federal government has to lead the way more broadly, Joe. All right. Uh, have we exhausted uh, all uh, debate and uh, speech and debate, <laughs> as they say? Oh, what, uh, one, one more. One, one more energetic. Microphone. Oh, sorry. Tell Dan just a second. Um, I, this will I be the last one. I meant to ask this as part of my technology question. That's a subject I have a lot of interest okay. in. Did you all account for any sort of contraction of the life sciences and supply side of if, if you have uh, insurance entities that are doing a better job constricting the flow of new technology or constricting the use of ex more expensive things, one concern is that those things might contract a bit, right? That you, you, you all don't well, think so? Uh, You're so your head. Let, let, let me ask the counter question. Are you assured that we don't have too much of those things going on now? I'm, I'm not saying that and So we don't. let me give you the best evidence I know on that. It's a remarkable and I think very important paper by uh, Alan Garber and, and a couple of colleagues from 2006, which analyzed the um, flow of new technologies, uh, basically prescription drugs they were looking at into the market. And they, they, they looked at this with uh, a whole bunch of different distributions of demand for, you know, essentially the distributions of risk for these uh, needing the drug. Uh, and they found that in the most favorable case they looked at, the monopoly profits, uh, once you get extensive insurance coverage, monopoly profits exceed the consumer surplus uh, from a new technology, which means we have too much in incentives for new, new in innovation. And I think that's the only piece I know that's carefully studied this. I think there's a reasonable case to be made that we have too much innovation right now. And so if we had a contraction, I wouldn't be worried about that. I'd be cheering its occurrence. Uh, but that's a imp very important balancing act between uh, controlling pharmaceutical prices and, and innovation since in a patent-based system, 
um, the expected profits are, are the, uh, widely considered to be the uh, a principal driving force for, uh, for uh, people who invest in innovation. Just a quick addendum, there's, a, there's another dimension to this, which is whether the technology we have is cost reducing or cost increasing. And that's in the entire healthcare system as opposed to uh, just the technology alone. Uh, and we've got some biases as to uh, who uh, calls the shots on that. Almost all the technology that we have over the long span of history has been cost increasing. Antibiotics are probably one of the few counterexamples. Vaccines are probably a counterexample. Um, but if you're looking at something like MRI or, or uh, new imaging technologies, for example, or robotic surgery, uh, and certainly gene therapies, they're cost increasing. They, they may have benefits that are very important, but they're not cost saving. They're cost increasing. The primary exception to that I know of, which comes back to the question that several of you raised, is uh, chronic uh, condition medications for hypertension and, and uh, uh, you know, think diabetes uh, most obviously, and those are areas where I think uh, access to drugs at uh, reasonable cost or no cost is probably cost reducing and certainly quality of life increasing. And uh, we started off this morning with uh, a bit of a uh, cooling trend, but I believe as the uh, more light's been added to the situation, we've got at least a localized warming uh, of the issue, and perhaps that uh, won't go global, but, but we can improve at least the healthcare right. sector. But please thank our, our excellent uh, speakers today. Thank you.